trying to be as uh, careful as possible here with the disinfecting and making sure we uh, sanitize, including the microphone. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We are in our second sermon of the book of Proverbs. We will be stopping the book of Proverbs for the summer, and then we're going to resume in the fall to a uh, Old Testament book. More than likely, it will be one of the uh, one of the small prophets. But in any case, this morning we come to the second portion of the first chapter of Proverbs, chapter one. And that will be verses 8 through 19. Proverbs 1, 8 through 19. If you are able, please join us in standing for the reading of God's Word. Proverbs 1, starting in verse 8. The Word of God reads, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching, for they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, Come with us, let us lie and wait for blood, let us ambush the innocent without reason. Like Sheol, let us swallow them alive, and whole, like those who go down to the pit. We shall find all precious goods. We shall fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot among us. We will all have one purse. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Hold back your foot from their paths, for their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. For in vain is a net spread in the sight of any bird. But these men lie in wait for their own blood, yet set an ambush for their own lives. Such are the ways of everyone who is greedy for unjust gain. It takes away the life of its possessors. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for allowing us to congregate this morning, Lord. Lord, I ask that just as your word says, if anyone amongst us lacks wisdom, to ask. And that you will give generously that wisdom. Lord, may you grant us that attitude to come to you this morning with an acknowledgement that we need wisdom. Yes. Lord, may your Holy Spirit convict us to know that we need that wisdom. Yes. And that the wisdom comes from you, Lord. As we are instructed, may it be for your glory, for the glory of Christ, and for the building up of your church. We ask this, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, you may be seated. So last week, as Pastor Kevin preached on the first sermon, which we're going to be doing expositionally, expository preaching through Proverbs for the summer, as I briefly mentioned, he kind of touched upon an introduction that told us a background about the Proverbs, and then he told us a little bit about who the Proverbs are for and why we are going through Proverbs and why we should pay any attention to Proverbs. As a quick recap, the verses that we studied last week tells us that the Proverbs are for certain people. This is that they are for the simple so that they can gain prudence. That means for those that may not be too wise, right? So they can be prudent. That the Proverbs are for the youth, for the young people out there. For those that are inexperienced, for what? So that they may gain knowledge and discretion. Be discreet, be knowledgeable. We are told that it's also for the wise, even for those that are already wise, in order for them to increase in learning. There's no such thing as reaching a state of wisdom in which we cannot no longer gain anymore. And then it is also for those who do understand to obtain further guidance. So just looking at that quick recap, we therefore know that none of us are exempt from heeding, from paying attention, mm -hmm. from being careful to listen to what Proverbs has to say in order for us to lead a life full of wisdom. So the title of this message today 
is an invitation to instruction or destruction. We will see that the first couple of verses, there's an invitation to instruct, an invitation to teach, to hear the teaching. And then later there's a series of warnings about not to heed the call to destruction. Briefly, we can see how this will apply to us. Let us be reminded that in the day that we're living, from every which way we are being invited. Invited to what? Invited to believe something, invited to be persuaded, invited to adopt a particular type of thinking. How does this happen? You may think, oh, not to me, I mean, I'm strong-minded, you know, I'm not weak. But no, if you have your guard down, that's the first indication that you may be already being swept by the constant bombardment of someone or something trying to convince you. This comes when we listen to the radio, when we listen to podcasts, when we listen to music, when we read books, articles, newspaper, etc., etc. Whatever we're consuming, whether it's in the form of... Um, of hearing, of reading, of viewing, of even playing video games, there is a certain message that is being given to you so that you adapt your mind to think in certain ways. Even this morning, as we open up the Word of God, there is no secret that what we are doing is we are trying to persuade ourselves. As I preach, I'm heralding, I'm explaining, I'm pleading with you to consider what God has, God has to say so that you may be persuaded in your mind to think like the Word of God instructs us to think. So there's no hiding the ball. I am too trying to do that this morning by guiding you to what God says in His Word. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we are told by the Apostle Paul that God uses us to make an appeal to men to persuade, it says in verse 11, to persuade so that others may be convinced by us being ambassadors of Christ, so they may be convinced, they may be persuaded into what? Into metanoia, into a change of mind, a change of heart, into a life of repentance. So the Bible too makes that appeal, okay? And that appeal that the Word of God makes to us is in competition to every other invitation out there that you have in order to change your mind and your heart. God too is doing that through His Word. So now that we kind of get an idea of what we mean by an invitation, <clears throat> let us remind us that that invitation in the family unit is not only to the parents, but it's also to the children. And we will see that in this passage. So not only us, but our kids are being invited and pulled in various directions to adopt a certain particular ideology. To adopt certain values and virtues. Or many times, so-called virtues. And nobody is exempt from this exposure. Just like the book of Proverbs tells us that everybody needs wisdom. We ought to remember that everybody is exposed to all these invitations from everywhere to think, to do certain things. So this morning, this passage is calling out to us, is issuing a warning, a loving and firm reminder from a father to a son, telling him to listen to a certain message and not to listen, to resist, to reject to abstain from another type of message. Accept one message, reject another. This not only comes in the form of changing the mind in order not to participate in an act, but let us pay special attention that before we act out a particular sin or act of evil, much before that, we were persuaded. We already thought in our mind and in our heart what we would do. And our doing so is only the very last step of carrying out that sin. So then, once we do that, 
many times we realized that we were fooled. We were enticed. We were tricked. We were lured by the deceitfulness of sin. And what we know from the words of Jesus is that we must guard our mind and heart because that's where our sin begins. Jesus reminds us that we are murderers at heart because we have anger, we have rage with our fellow brother. And it's not just that a malicious intent to murder someone was in the spark of the moment, right? I mean, it may be triggered by anger, but our state of being angry and being rebellious and having that rage, that didn't happen in that moment. That comes from a history of us being open and adopting an ideology that will lead us to do that. Let us be reminded, the book of James tells us very clearly, verses 14 and 15 of chapter 1 says, But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So therefore, sin, let us remember, starts because our own desires that appeal to our sinful nature was aroused and we went for it, right? So this morning then the theme is going to be an invitation to instruction and an invitation to destruction. Instruction and destruction. There's a contrast. Let us think of how we in the past have been lured, have been invited into a path, into an act of destruction. How many times perhaps we have fallen for that? And let us then think how we can guard ourselves, guard our mind, guard our heart, so that we don't fall into this destruction invitation, and rather, how can we heed, how can we listen to instruction? So let us dig right in into the text. The first two verses that we're studying today is a righteous invitation, is an admonition to listen, to heed instruction. Verses 8 and 9, let us look at verse 8 first. It says, Hear my son your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching. This is a resemblance, almost word for word, of Proverbs 6.20, which very similarly says, My son... Keep your father's commandment and forsake not your mother's teaching. So this is a repetitive theme in the book of Proverbs. A loving father speaking to his son. In the hopes that the son will listen. We just heard in, in verse 7, as Pastor Kevin preached last week, that those who are foolish will not want to be instructed. The fools hate instruction and correction. That's also a constant theme in Proverbs. So let us approach this text this morning with a spirit of humility. Yes, I need instruction. And ask God, as the book of James says, as we just uh, briefly said earlier, Lord, I need wisdom. Give me wisdom. So here in that verse, the call of a father to a son. It's twofold. One, hear the instruction of the Father. And secondly, to not forsake, to not forget, to not neglect the teaching of the mother. So before the exhortation to the son or to a daughter starts, let us first acknowledge that there's an earlier exhortation before we talk to the youth, before we talk to the kids. This is an exhortation to who? To the parents. Why? Because what good would it be if the instruction of a father is no different than what the world is teaching the son? Yeah. Right? What good will it be the teaching of a mother if the teaching of the mother is not based in the teachings of Scripture and the precepts of the Bible, but rather to teach a son or a daughter to be good for goodness sake, having behavior that complies but never having a heart that submits to Christ. What good will that be? Parents, guardians, 
anyone who has influence to the youth, to the young, to children, you have a chance to instruct and to teach the youth. The question is, what is your instruction based upon? Is your instruction and your demand for obedience only so that kids can live us alone and I can carry on with, with what I'm doing? Right, that's a call to us as parents. And let us realize and ask ourselves, is there any difference between what I'm teaching my kids and what the rest of the world wants them to believe? Is there a difference there? Are the values you're teaching your children, are those the same values being advanced in what you watch on TV by culture at large, by all the celebrities? Is what they're putting out, are the talking points that they are spitting out, do they match what you are instilling to your children? If you are, that's a huge red flag. Because that means that you may not be looking, or rather you are not looking at Scripture. Scripture goes against culture by nature. So before getting off the ground then with this passage of the call to the children, to the youth, to listen to the teaching and the instruction of parents, first, the call comes to fathers and mothers to instruct your children in the ways of God. And as we just briefly mentioned, an easy test is, is what I'm teaching my children the same as what they're going to be learning from culture? That's a huge test, a huge question to ask ourselves. And if you are doing a good job raising your kids and teaching them the ways of God, be prepared to be told that you are crazy. Be prepared to be told that you are doing it wrong. So now, the exhortation to the children begins. So children, when your parents, when your father instructs you, listen. When your mother teaches you, do not be indifferent to her teaching. Like, oh, I already know my mom, you know, she's always getting on my case. No, children, listen. Why? Why do parents want to teach you? Do parents want to teach you because they don't want you to have fun? Do parents want to teach you because they want you to hate them? Right? As, as you, as children, I remember being young. I, I think I thought that at some point. Maybe that my parents don't get it. Like, what are they going to know? Like, I... I want to do what I want to do. So then, children are called to obedience. Ephesians 6, 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. That's the exhortation from Scripture to children. And your parents instruct you, your parents give you directions, give you boundaries and rules, because they love you. Because your parents were once your age. And because your parents do know better than you. I often ask my daughter when she is struggling, obeying, I ask her, Steady, who knows better, you or your daddy? Do you think what your daddy's telling you is going to be bad for you? I have this conversation with her to make her understand that the reason I'm instructing her is because I love her. And in such manner, the instruction of the father to the son in this passage is one of love. Son, I'm telling you this because I love you. That's the reason for instruction. So it gives the what? Verse 8 told you for the son to listen to instruction, to not forsake the teaching of the mother. Now verses 9 tells us why. It says, for those teachings in that instruction, it says, for they are a graceful garden for your head and pendants for your neck. This is a poetic type of language that is forming an analogy about how a, a wreath for the head, an adornment for the head and the neck is one that is worn by somebody who has great character, by someone who holds high honor and integrity. It's the poetic language that the proverb is saying, just like an adornment for your head, for your neck, as beautiful jewelry, 
That's what instruction, that's what heeding to that teaching is going to give you, but in your character. It's putting an analogy of physical beauty of those who hold high honor and respect to those that have good character, godly character, because of the wisdom that they've listened to. Now listen, that wisdom does not come naturally. Sure, we have different personalities. Sure, children have different ways of listening and being receptive to instruction. But we must instruct children because out of the box, out of the factory, so to speak, we are all fallen and we are all wicked. So we need that instruction. And that instruction is what's going to give those adornments to the character of a person. Now, as beautiful as the symbolism is, the irony here is that ultimately a godly character is more important than physical beauty. As the scripture tells us that God looks at the heart. Right? God looks at the heart. Because after all, we could be adorned and have precious jewelry, but our character could still be full of evil. Our mind and heart could still be malicious. So the instruction and the teaching of a godly father and a godly mother will be an adornment to the character, to the building of character of the child. This was the invitation to instruction and wisdom and the outcome would be a godly character. Now, let us look at the next section. The next section is sort of a threefold warning of the father to the son. A threefold warning from the father to the son. Let's look at verse 10. It says, My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. This is the first warning. And it's relatively straightforward. It says, When that invitation comes, Resist it. Say no. Be ready. It's coming, right? If we have any experience in life, realistically, we know that it's not a matter of if sinners will entice you, but when they entice you. My brothers, my sisters, as our children grow, those enticements for them to be involved in sin are going to become greater and of more and more detrimental impact if they partake in those sins. So it's not a matter of what or if, but when it's going to happen. Just as us ourselves that are older have been tempted by all sorts of evil. The word interesting here, entice, when sinners entice you, is the Greek word pata, which means to persuade a gullible person through deception or persuasion. In other words, that fresh mind who has hardly any experience in the world, right? As I like to say, they, they lack street smarts. That very fresh mind, prayers, trying to convince, trying to incite, trying to lure those minds into partaking of sin. That's the kind of language that is used to persuade the innocent mind. And although this is a hypothetical situation, right, if they come, when they come, it's a matter of when it's going to happen. The key being that those committing evil, they love company. They love to be joined in their wicked desires and acts. And the father knows that the invitation will be tempting, right? Because if the invitation to sin was not tempting, the father wouldn't be so worried about it. And this touches on the theme of the Bible that when we are tempted by sin, that sin appeals to our likings, right? A wise theologian once said that Satan has never tempted you with an evil that you do not love. Think about that. The father knows that when the sinner enticed his son, it's going to be appealing. It's going to look good. Right? Verses 11 and 12 says, If they say, come with us, 
Let us lie in wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without reason, like Sheol. Let us swallow them alive and whole, like those who go down to the pit. This is warning number two. So warning number one says, resist, refuse invitation. Warning number two is essentially saying, be careful, son. This is what they're going to tell you. The father knows how this scheme works. This is what they're going to tell you. And there's no hiding the fact that what they will do is evil and is against the innocent. Not innocent in the sense that they're sinless, but innocent in the sense that those people they're targeting have done no wrong to them. They're innocent bystanders minding their own businesses. And those are the people that the evil people enticing the son are going to be targeting. Someone who has done no wrong to them. So warning number three, verses 13 and 14 says, We shall find all precious goods. We shall fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot among us. We will have one purse. Warning number three is what? This is what they will promise you will have. This is what they're going to show you as, look, this is what, this is going to be the spoil, this is going to be the plunder. This is going to be the profit. So warning one, refuse the invitation. Warning number two, this is what they're going to tell you. Warning number three, son, be careful because this is what they're going to tell you you're going to have. This is what they're going to offer you. The reward for your sin. And the appeal to sin, it has several characteristics. First, it looks easy. Right? Come on, just do it. It's not going to take much. We're all in this together. Another appeal to sin is you will pay off fast. You don't need to work. You don't need to wait. You don't need to save. You don't need to endure. It's going to be quick. Fast. Quick payoff. Immediate gratification, right? That's one of the so-called virtues of our culture. Immediate gratification. Wait now. I want to get my phone right now. Don't worry. It will be home tomorrow, if not by this afternoon. Right now. The appeal of sin also tells us that you're going to have something to show for it. You're going to have this. It's going to be quick, it's going to be easy, and you're going to have X, Y, Z, whatever that may be. And then there's a promise of companionship in sharing what will be gained. A promise of companionship. Like, hey, you're my bro, man. Back. Right? A wicked sinner inviting other to partake in his wrongdoing, promising companionship, promising loyalty, promising sharing the profit. Think of this really as a liar promising that he's telling you the truth. That's basically what it is. Because when push comes to shove, when the plan ends up failing. Do you think that sinners, those who invite you, are going to be there for you? Right? Maybe some of us, by even personal experience, we know the answer to this. Everybody's out to save themselves once things go wrong. You got no friends. So this is all to remind us of the deceitfulness of sin. It appeals to what I like. It's going to be quick. It's going to be easy. There's going to be gain. There's going to be a promise of companionship and of sharing. And it is all the deceit. It is all to persuade me to partake of sin with the evildoers. So those were the warnings of the Father to the Son. Now, the father breaks into a, a plea, into a final appeal to tell his son how important it is for him to listen. So first it was, son, please listen. Listen to my teaching. Listen to your mother. Secondly, son, be careful. This is what they're going to tell you. Be careful. And now, 
Son, please don't. Please. Final appeal. Verses 15 and 16. It says, My son, do not walk in the way with them. Hold back your feet from their paths, for their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. This pleading of love from the father to the son is seen three different times in the passage that we're looking at. What is that phrase? Two words. See that? My son. My son. My son. The loving plea of the father in verse 8, verse 10, and verse 15. The father almost saying, my son, if you knew what I know, if you had the experience that I have, if you knew how evil people out there are trying to get you, are trying to convince you, are trying to intrude into your mind to steal you away from what I'm teaching you. My son, my son, if you only knew the cry to the father, to a son that he loves. And the warning here is because the father knows that the paths that evil doers and enticers are going to offer his child they are to shed blood. They are to do evil, to do harm. Someone lies here is at stake. Not only the life of the child who is being enticed, but the life of those who have done really no wrong that are being targeted. Blood will be shed. Some of the, some of the commandments that are being broken here do not murder. We're going to shed blood to get what we want. Do not murder. But yet the love of possession says, kill so you can gain. Do it. Do not steal. But the love of possession say, take it. It's going to be all right. Do not covet. But the love of possessions and gain says, take what others have. You deserve it. It's not really theirs. I mean, let's rationalize this so that we can commit this crime and how, somehow justify it. And then, most importantly, do not have other gods before me, right? That's what God says. Don't have other gods. But what? The love of money, the love of power, the love of possession says, God cannot fulfill you. You need other things. So go and get them. The way that sin appeals to us, then makes us what? An idolater? One who is being enticed into falling into sin as an idolater, someone who covets, someone who steals, and someone who even will kill. And we may say, oh, I wouldn't go that far. Really? Let us take heed, right? Because we know that sin blinds us. And it is not that from one day to another, all of a sudden I turn into a murderer. It's that little by little by little. As my conscience gets callous, all of a sudden I realize I'm not too far away from any sin. Colossians 3.5 says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So from the invitation to destruction, we should look to the invitation for instruction. To flee, to get away from those things. As we see over and over in Scripture, in this case, Colossians 3 5. The, God, and the sad truth here is that, as I said, the times where, where we are tempted, even though as Christians we hate sin, and we are being instructed day by day to flee from sin, it is very appealing. Oh, it's so appealing that we fall for it, right? If it wasn't, it would, be, it would be an issue, right? So that's what we have to take heed. We have to listen. We have to be on guard. And then verses 17 and 18 in his final plea from the Father to the Son says, For in vain is the net spread in the sight of any bird. But these men lie in wait for their own blood. They set an ambush for their own lives. So what's the final outcome when all is said and done? Sin 
puts blindfolds on those committing evil. And they don't realize that ultimately, even if it seems like they're getting away with what they're doing, even if it seems that even in this lifetime, they got away with it, ultimately, whether in justice from this world or in justice from the world to come, they're going to get justice. They're not going to escape. They have set a trap that is going to be their own trap. And the beautiful analogy here is basically if a bird sees or if an animal sees that there's a trap set before them, even the animal is not stupid. They're not going to go and get trapped. They're going to avoid the trap. <laughs> Much more a human being setting up a trap He's not going to think that he's going to be trapped in it, right? Because we think we're much smarter. But because of the deceitfulness of sin, because of the blinders that sin, the disobedience puts on us, we don't realize that the ultimate effect of our sin is going to be our own blood. It's going to be our own demise. It's going to be our own life. Sooner or later. We're going to fall victims to our own scheme. And then it says, verse 19, is sort of the punchline. So who is this talking about? Why are they being enticed into sinning and falling into that? Verse 19 says, Such are the ways of everyone who is greedy for unjust gain. It takes away the life of its possessors. Unjust gain takes away the livelihood of those who it belong to. So why are evildoers going through the scheme of trapping the innocent and inviting others to join them for unjust gain? That's the immediate context of this passage. Taking, taking something that doesn't belong to you, forcing someone to give you what is theirs, claiming yours what others have gained through their own sweat, blood, and tears. Does this ring a bell, by the way, in our very circumstances in our country in recent days? Right? I mean, unfortunately it does. How about looting and rioting? This time around, I haven't seen it personally, right? Because, thank God, our neighborhood hasn't been affected. But I remember in the 90s, when I was living as a child in South Central LA, I was evacuated from our home at about 2 in the morning because everything around us was burning. And I remember as my parents drove me to Mongo's house, seeing everybody looting, stealing, and burning. Right? Just as we see today in the news. Or maybe some of you have seen it in real life. Unfortunately, this then becomes almost a a word-for-word -word application of what this proverb is warning us about. And the irony here is that those that are doing this, they actually vindicate themselves by saying that so-called justice is being carried out. Nevertheless, what has happened is that the very thing they're supposedly protesting and opposing, they have become that very thing. They've become the oppressors of the bystanders that they are supposedly for. They themselves have become oppressors and not fighters of justice because they're obtaining unjust gain. Unjust gain. Then they not only do it, but invite others to join their cause. Right? So then. Unfortunately, this becomes almost a word-for-word -word application of the text today. But as we just saw, let us not be forgetful. God is not mocked. Either in this lifetime or when we meet our Creator, justice will be done. Will be done. God is not mocked. And in the end, evildoers will meet their justice. Now, with that said, a call to repentance, an exhortation, an exhortation to discipline, 
as we also learn from God's word, doesn't begin outside. Where does it start? Here with us in the house of God, in the household of God. So then, have we been enticed into sinning to get unjust gain? Have we taken advantage of someone or something or a system here and there in order to get ahead financially or materially? Have we done that? We may easily say, oh, that's, I mean, maybe a little bit, but it's not as bad as so-and-so. That's our first go-to, right? What are we doing? Justifying ourselves. We cannot do that, brothers and sisters. How many times have we been enticed by the chasing after money, by following after earthly treasures. Have we not done that? So all of a sudden, all those evildoers out there are pointing at us. So what about you? Right? Discipline, repentance begins in the household of God. Not only that, but we have a call to preach the gospel, to call those to repentance who aren't doing so. It's an exhortation for all of us. So then, what do we come to learn in this passage? As a recap. First, we saw that the responsibility of inculcating wisdom starts where? At home. With the parents. If we're away for the school system, whether Christian or secular, doesn't matter. Whether we have let our guard down and have waited for that system to educate our children, we are in for a surprise. What happened to, to little Tommy or whatever it may be? I thought they were being instructed. Well, yeah, they were being instructed. Whether it be by the school system or by the videos I watch or People they interact online, whatever it may be. Yeah, they're being instructed. Responsibility starts at home with the parents. Secondly, we have seen that bad company will corrupt you. Bad company will corrupt you. And unfortunately, our evil and sinful nature is attracted to bad company. Okay, we love that. So we have to give a chance to those sinners to entice me. I'm like, oh, please don't, don't, don't tempt me. Okay, so what do you got? That's our nature, our fallen nature. Bad company will corrupt you. I'm reminded of the verse, the first verse of the Book of Psalms, which, by the way, it has a significance for me because there was a time where I actually was being tempted. I was being tempted. And as I was walking to the store to buy a belt, there was a homeless man just mumbling and speaking what I thought was nonsense. As a matter of fact, it is nonsense to the world. And as I approached the store, I was thinking, you know what? Every time that somebody's mumbling or talking or trying to get attention, I want to talk to them. Because I want to see what they have to say. With the ultimate purpose, of speaking about the gospel. And this time I was like, oh, I hope this guy doesn't talk to me. And he probably wasn't, but by God's wisdom and divine appointment, the man said, blessed is the man that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Psalm 1, verse 1. I remember that clearly. And it was like a slap to me. Wake up. Where you going? But there's been other times that I've received similar warnings and instruction from God. And what have I done? It's not for me. I mean, that was a coincidence. And therefore, we heed instru instruction to not the word of God, but we heed the invitation to destruction. How many times have we not fallen for that? Another thing that we gather then from this passage is that the ultimate instruction to us from the loving Father 
is from God. Where? In His Word. As Scripture states that all of the Bible is God breathed, God inspired it. And we are told that it is used for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the men of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3.16 right? So, as the Bible-believing church, our stance is that the Bible, the Scriptures, contain everything we need for the matters of life, doctrine, and practice. It is all in the Scriptures. And as we've seen in the book of Proverbs, that is like immediate application. How can we deny that those things apply to us? And then, we need to remember this. The enticement to partake in sin in our modern world is not necessarily by inviting us to go murder someone. It's not necessarily an invitation to come and let's rob a bank. It's not necessarily that. It's a little bit more subtle, although it's becoming more and more blatant. That invitation, my friends, is through an appeal to adjust your worldview. An appeal to change your mind, to change your heart. Just as the Word of God tells us that He makes an appeal to us into a transformed heart and mind, like so, the world around us is trying to call us in an invitation to change that into the way that they think. This is in the form of a strong and aggressive push by academia, by the media, whether it is social media and all the garbage that people post, or by the news or commentators or whatnot. By the media elites, celebrities, and just the culture at large, there's a huge call for Christians to adopt a changed worldview, a modified worldview. So this is the way in which we need to be guards up, guard our mind, guard our heart, Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We are to test the ideas, the concepts, the consequences of whatever it is people are telling you by the Word of God. Proverbs 4, 23 says, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flows the springs of life. So scripture tells us, guard your mind, guard your heart. Because it's being pulled from each and every way. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a couple of examples. Our culture has sort of gone through an escalation process. Not too long ago, I remember this even being in college, even though I was not involved in in anything uh, spiritual at the time, but I remember clearly. It started off something like, hey, just be tolerant of everyone's beliefs. Just be cool with it. Relax, don't, don't interfere with anybody, whatever people want to believe, that's up to them, which seems reasonable, right? But I was gone from that, just be passive and don't say anything. It's been gone from that to, hey, don't criticize other worldviews. Don't speak bad about it. Don't bring up ways in which you disagree about those things in public or question. Don't criticize. Then that went to, hey, actually accept my beliefs. However wicked they be, now accept them. And now we've gone from that, not only accept them, now celebrate them. Tell me you agree, tell me you celebrate, and tell me you embrace and approve of what I'm doing. And if you don't, oh, we're going to shut you down. Right? There's been that escalation in the culture that is telling you, it's inviting you to change your world, your worldview, your mind, your heart, your convictions. There is also a big push to trade the gospel. And I'm talking about churches, let alone outside, but in churches. There's a huge push 
to trade the gospel for a social gospel, mm -hmm. for social, so-called social justice. Mm -hmm. now, hear me out of this. As Christians, we are people of justice. We are people who long for and promote righteousness. However, this idea of, of the social gospel or so-called social justice, it requires you to embrace a certain worldview. It requires you to embrace a thing called critical race theory. It requires you to accept the concept of intersectionality, which is in a hierarchy of victimhood, pretty much. And the key is, without even saying whether those are valid points or not, or valid concepts, the key is that it necessarily, hear me out, necessarily requires you to neglect and forsake the gospel. Okay? It, necess it necessitates that. And therefore, an abandoning of the gospel to put something else in its place that has been modified would put us in the curse of Galatians 1. Because we typically look at that passage and say, oh yeah, you know, if other religions or other beliefs that don't have the correct Jesus come to you and preach that to you, let them be a curse. My brothers and sisters, this can also be more subtle in a way which, oh yeah, you could, you know, you could believe in Jesus, you could go to church and that, but take the gospel away and put this instead. That is also another gospel. Therefore, the level playing field is that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You want to talk about equality? That's the equality right there. We're all doomed. We all fall short and we all need Jesus. A couple more. Another example is that we are being pressured, not only by culture, but again, from within the church, not to really preach Jesus boldly, but to have a focus on this cause, or that cause, or this movement, or that movement. Well, I can't do that. I cannot preach otherwise. I cannot preach other than Christ and Him crucified. Amen. Only through the preaching of the cross can reconciliation, true reconciliation, be achieved. Because reconciliation must, must first be done with God and then with fellow men. Only through the preaching of sin can we come to know that we are enemies of God and that apart from Christ, we all will see eternal judgment. Only through the preaching of the gospel, that is the holiness of God, the wickedness of men, and the perfection of Christ through His death and resurrection, that we can be saved from such eternal consequences of our own sin. Only through the preaching of God's eternal plan for His people can we have peace with Him and with each other, so that then there's no division of tongue or tribe or gender or this and that or whatever other division they're putting out there for you to, to check the box on. Only through the preaching of the gospel. Now finally here I have a, a quote that I think is very appropriate from Dr. Al Mohler in referencing the cultural revolution which includes a sexual revolution and the overhaul of moral terminology to mean totally different things than we are used to them meaning and how this is becoming an invitation for us Christians. Dr. Mulder says, and I quote, the society around us is in the process of a giant comprehensive reset and if we are not careful, we are going to be reset right along with the culture. Unquote. So what is the world saying? They're saying, hey, listen, this is the new morality. These are the new virtues. So get with the program. This is the invitation enticing us to join with them. It's an invitation unto destruction. Because biblical Christianity is not only not compatible 
with the nonsense that the culture is telling you to adopt, it is actually diametrically opposed to what we're being told. And as Christians then, we need to realize that this is going on each and every day. The invitation to adopt, to change your mind, your heart, and then to do and live accordingly. That's a constant invitation that you and I are being given. Now there's a warning. If you agree, if we agree, with the talking points of the media and the celebrities, everything they're constantly putting out, that's a huge red flag. My fellow brothers and sisters, as your pastor, I plead with you, just as the father in Proverbs pleaded with his son, when you are bombarded with this type of thinking from the world on a daily basis, resist that invitation. Do not fall for that invitation. Rather, heed the instruction, not the destruction that you're being invited. And it's, they're enticing you. It sounds good. Oh, look, yes, it's virtuous. It has all those deceitfulness factors to deceive you. But rather look to Jesus, to his word, for instruction that leads to life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, as Peter said, where can we go? For you are the one who has the words of eternal life. Help us to turn to you and only to you in this time. Lord, and also perhaps if we are in a position of being the oppressors and being those who entice others to sin, but we repent, however big or little the evil that we are scheming may be, may we repent from that, Lord. Please help us, Lord, to heed your word of instruction this day. May your Holy Spirit work in us so that we may recognize when the enticement comes and that we may resist it so that the devil may flee.